Well, here we are. Good morning and welcome to the All Portable Discussion Zone. It's a bi-weekly live stream all about amateur radio portable ops. Let me catch my breath here. All right. Sorry about that. I, uh, I got a little phlegm there. Um, uh, with me this, uh, my name is Charlie, uh, call signs November Juliet 7 Victor. And with me this morning are my show's uh, two co hosts, Dan, KC7 MSU. Good morning. And Brian, W7JET. Morning. And also, I am pleased to introduce to you today's guest, Chris, Mike Zero Romeo, Sierra Foxtrot from England. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning, Good. Brian. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Hope Chris. All well. Good morning. Welcome to you. Uh, and of course, as always, we have the uh, regular characters in the chat room. We have uh, all the people who are joining us uh, later on. Um, we're happy you're joining us this morning, and we have a, a good show uh, in store for you. Of course, if you have a question uh, um, or a comment, go ahead and leave that in the chat, and uh, we'll be uh, sure to respond to you. And don't forget, this show is converted to a podcast and is available through uh, most podcast players about 24 hours after the show ends. And if you'd like to support the show by buying us a coffee or a Coke, you can do so by clicking on the link below. So first, let's get caught up on what's been going on over the past few weeks since we've uh, last <laughs> met. And uh, we'll get going with Dan. Why don't you uh, lead us out, buddy? All right. Well, it's been a relatively quiet uh, uh, week here uh, in Arizona. Uh, finally recovering from the holidays here. So all is good. And I did finally get out on a summit. It's been quite a while. So uh, on the 31st of December, I uh, hit the Lone Mountain with Ray K8DRT from Michigan. And uh, it was a little cool and uh, a little wet, but uh, we managed to both uh, get enough contacts to activate the hill. So hi out to uh, Ray if you're out there today. Cool. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. And let's go to Brian. So got a little soda in on Monday, did uh, Two Rock Mountain um, up in the Prescott area. A little, little snowy, a little wet, a little muddy. Um, was planning on doing um, uh, uh, heliograph again on Wednesday when I was in Safford, but there was a lot of snow. Um, I actually drove up to the Shannon uh, campground, and when I by the time I got to it, I'm like, yeah, this isn't going to work. I don't have anything that's uh, really uh, good enough to hike through this kind of snow depth. So maybe next time I'm there, which would be about two weeks, I'll... Uh, I'll go do it again. And um, and that was it. So just uh, one soda this week and been keeping busy around the house, doing a little uh, little shack stuff. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay, good. And then for me, I uh, sure I'm sure some of you know, for the Christmas holiday, I uh, and my wife flew out to Georgia to see some family. And while I was there, I was able to meet up with uh, my, my friend, Doug. Let me uh, clear my throat again. Uh, that's he's a N four H and H has a good YouTube channel and then his brother uh, Joel uh, K four or W four K W M so I we did uh, two summits on that to activate on that uh, day and just had a great time he those both those guys are just hilarious and and uh, full of knowledge and just fun guys so uh, that's I guess what I've been up to um, all right let's uh, go our, to our guest now Chris and see what uh, he's been up to okay guys festive season. Uh, we've had Christmas and the New Year. It was before Christmas, my last activation. Um, seeing family, which is fabulous. Here in the UK, restrictions, uh, they're up and down a little bit. It was fantastic. I saw I saw my son, who's 22 years old. He's up in Teesside. Um, I haven't seen him for almost two years due to, to various restrictions. So it was fantastic to see him. Um, and then back to work, back to, back to normality. I do... I admire you guys. I'm impressed how active you guys are and the effort you put into to activate <laughs> things. It really is impressive. Thank you so much, Chris. All right. Well, uh, that's good. Good news. Uh, yeah, those uh, those lockdowns and stuff like that and restrictions sometimes uh, are a pain in the butt with uh, visiting families. So I'm glad you're able to, to do that. So, Chris, I first learned about you from your YouTube channel, which I think is an excellent channel. It's, I, I love the diversity that you put out there and just some of the knowledge and uh, technical expertise you have. And so I, I, I thought I'd bring you on to, to talk to you a little bit more about uh, portable radio because you do a lot of really interesting, unique things out there in, in, uh, in uh, the UK. 
And so, but before we get going, talking about your YouTube channel and some of your uh, your portable radio stuff, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of what you do for a living and, and uh, whatever else you might think is important. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the channel, Charlie. Work in the motor trade, uh, the, the car parks trade. Um, I've been with Natalie, my partner, for uh, 11 years, which is interesting. The day that I met Natalie, I actually sat my uh, full license exam. It was the same day, so that was quite a good day with that. I was first licensed um, June 2005. I did the, the foundation over here and got the call sign Mike 3 Kilo Foxtrot Bravo. Allowed to run 10 watts, the foundation over here in the UK. Uh, the year after, uh, April, I think, 2006, I sat and passed the intermediate exam. I got the call sign to Echo Zero Foxtrot Sierra Romeo. Um, That's a mouthful. It's a nightmare. Yeah, we have two E zero for the the intermediate for the the middle level uh, of call signs over here. Uh, and then 2011, April 2011, I sat and passed the the, the full exam and got the call sign Mike Zero Romeo Sierra Foxtrot, which almost looks like Morse if you look at it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and when I got this call sign. I decided to just go the QRP route, the low power route. Um, I have an ICOM 705 that obviously does 10 watts, uh, and I'm a big fan of the ASO FT817, which I've owned one since 2006, and all of the radio bits. Uh, and I've had a blast in that time. I, I don't like operating from home, but I do like getting out of the comfort zone of the shack, portable operating. That's, that's what I get a buzz out of. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So, so Chris, how long have you been? Have you lived in the UK or, or in England? Uh, have you been all your life? All my life, yeah. Uh, Fifty-three years old now. Okay. Uh, Don't so, look you, it, but... <laughs> <laughs> were you raised in the same area there in Yorkshire or somewhere else? Yes, um, I lived on the east coast for the first two years of my life. Uh -huh. A place called Bridlington, uh, and then moved to Leeds when I said when I was two years old. Oh, okay. I've lived in this area ever since. Okay, um, and what got you interested in doing ham radio? Did uh, since it was, you just, I think you got your license about the same time I did. Okay, um, when I was thirteen years old, I arrived home from school. Uh, my brother had bought a CB radio. I don't know if any of you guys were on CB radio. Um, Nineteen eighty-one, when it first became legal, there was a big boom over here in the UK. I was only thirteen years old. I wasn't working, of course. I couldn't afford to buy any of my own equipment and stuff and i seen him speaking to people and i was fascinated how i could speak to people from school this is before, before the internet and mobile phones and all the rest of it and i was absolutely fascinated um and then that sort of died off a little bit when computers started to become popular the home computers like the zx spectrum the commodore 64s then later on the atari st and the amigas they they sort of they became really popular popular mid 80s uh, and a friend of mine, Billy, 2E0WJC, who's known me since I was about three years old, we were on the CB together. And I was talking to him and I says, how do you fancy having a, getting into this ham radio? And he, he says, what about the Morse code? He says, I'm terrified of it. I says, you don't have to do it now. You don't have to do it. You just have to do an appreciation of it. So you when, sort of When understand. did that change? Uh, I'm not sure when that changed. Say, our license 2005. And so... they dropped it by then. Yeah, got it. And there was a, there was a we had this pen and paper, and there, there were a chap sat opposite us at a table, sending really slow CW, and you literally wrote down the dots and dars. You wrote down what you hear, what you heard, and if you heard something wrong, you could say, "Oh, can you set that send that one again, please?" And then he'd go make a cup of tea, come back, and you got the sheet of paper with all the letters and numbers on, and you had to write down sort of what you'd heard, just an appreciation of it. In fact, I remember when I sat mine, the guy. Um, that that uh, did the appreciation of CW says with me, the only way you'll fail this is if you die halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I said. Wow, that's a that's so, a pretty so good answer. So me, me and uh, Billy, we we sat as foundation, which was excellent when we were first became licensed because I had someone to talk to, someone that uh, I'd known a lot of years. So that's that's how we got into to amateur cool. radio. Well, since you're talking about that, why don't we just explore that just a little bit further? So you have your friend, you said his name is Billy, right? Billy, yes. Yeah. So who all do you hang out with then? How, who, who do you go? You, do you go out with uh, other people um, when you're doing ham radio or is, it, is Billy still in it or, or what's the deal there? 
Billy's done some amateur radio with me. He's done quite a, quite a few sort of summits. Um, there were a chap, bless him, called Neil, Mike Three, uh, Uniform November Golf, who knew me and Billy. We all sort of grew up in the same area on the same estate. Neil sadly passed away a few years ago. He was only 58. Um, I did a lot with Neil as well, who were fantastic. We had a little um, plan together. There's a cafe not far from where you live, a really nice cafe that opens at eight o'clock in the morning. And I used to pick Neil up, quarter to eight, and we'd go to the cafe, and we'd have full English, full English breakfast, you know, fill us up. And then well, what's a full English breakfast, man? Oh, you know, the sausage, the bacon, the eggs, <laughs> the mushrooms, the full, everything yeah. that's bad for you. <laughs> everything that's really not good for you. Yeah. And, and then we'd disappear off in, into the hills for the day. So that's awesome. made, I, I suppose, I think about 90% of my uh, activations are, are done by myself. Okay. Yeah. So you don't, you, you usually like to go by yourself then? Yeah. I yeah. have done activations with, with members of clubs that I've been members of, with friends, sometimes uh -huh. um, people that are not licensed radio amateurs that are fascinated how when you're activating something and you know people's names, you guys probably do it yourself. That yeah. They'll sit down. They'll sit down with a cup of tea and they'll watch me put out my CQ call and someone will call in and I'm like, oh, how, John, how are you doing? You know, how, David, how are you? And they're like, how do you know people's names? <laughs> you guys are probably the same. Yeah. Yep, regular yep. chases. And you sort of feel like you get to know people through this. You guys are probably the same people you've been speaking to uh, for years. Yeah, you know yourself. Great. When you're portable sometimes, it's... It's almost a contest exchange, isn't it? the reference, the signal report, where you are, sort of thing, and and you're done. Um, and yeah, regular callers, and they're fascinated by it, but ninety percent are done by myself. Yeah, you know, there's something to be said for that too. I think uh, initially I went on a, a one or two with somebody, but then I did almost of most of mine were, you know, uh, at least early on were just by myself, and I really. There's something to be said for just doing it by yourself. There's, there's, it's more efficient, and you, you take less time, and you. I think you. There's some ways. In some ways, you enjoy it more. But you know, lately I've been taking people along a lot more, and and there is something to be said for that too. That the company is really nice sometimes. So it's, it's it, kind it of is. A give and take. It isn't is. It? That's my de-stress, to be honest. The, to disappear off into the hills, uh, make a sandwich, flask of tea, get the radio coming, and just disappear off. That's my de-stress. Yeah, you, yeah. You're ascending something. And if you want to stop for a rest and take some photographs or have a cup of tea, you can. You know, it's, yep. it's just fabulous. Just the outdoors, I just love it. Yeah, it's it's really nice going by yourself a lot of times because you don't feel... Whoops, what's that? You don't feel pressure to take in, you know, hit a specific schedule if you're a little bit later or not. You know, you don't have to worry about that schedule with from somebody else's point of view and it's easier to stop and like I said take pictures or just rest and enjoy the view for a little bit yeah uh was that dan you mute for a minute see if that's you let's see who it is not dan probably uh, nope. let me see here maybe that whatever it was oh well we'll i didn't uh, hear anything all right some well, extra rf there's some RF getting in somehow, so we'll we'll figure it out as we go. Uh, nobody move. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. Let me just try something. No. Oh, it's Brian. Oh. Yep, it's Brian. All right. Well, let's. What's go going on? on? Yeah. Uh, I think it's you, Brian, but I'm not sure. Let's. Uh, we're we're doing good now. So. Okay. Um. Anyway, let's uh, let's go ahead and get to the next question here, which I have is, how long have you been ham? You already <laughs> answered that, so why don't we talk a little bit about some of your the ways that you like to do portable radio? Because on your channel, talk a little bit about your channel and some of the things that you've highlighted recently. Uh, the various award schemes um, operating portable for those is is where I feel most comfortable, to be honest. These videos on there. Um, when I'm in the shack and I've showed people how to do things, uh, yeah, they're okay, but I'd much prefer to get out and do do uh, the radio things outdoors. Um, I think that's what I'm most comfortable with, and and that's what uh, that's what I enjoy doing. Okay, uh, what what's your favorite? So is Soda your favorite uh, activation or favorite program? Um, I don't particularly have a favorite. Okay, it, it's not it's not about the points for me. 
it's just about getting out and uh, yeah. and, and sort of enjoying the outdoors. Okay. When I was younger, I would do two sort of summits in a day, uh, often some quite substantial ones. Uh -huh. I'd go up one and activate two meters FM, and as soon as nobody responded to the no, no response to the QRZ, I'd be down and up another one. I tend <laughs> to enjoy enjoy being on the top now. Try and try and do more bands if you like. Most of my if you have a look at my uh, sort of log, most is the HF, but I've yeah. started to lean towards HF a little bit more now, especially as Natalie M7 and TD, my my partner, she she likes to do the VHF side of things now. Yeah, um, so so that's how you operate, HF. right? That's yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. So um, kind of... If I'm by myself, um, it, you know yourself. It's it's depending if you've got time constraints. I do like to do HF, forty meters and twenty meters, but I will never not do VHF. I will never not do two meters because that was my bread and butter for a long time. If you like, that's that's where I started. Uh -huh. A lot of people that I used to speak to a long time, they still talk to you now. They're still there. I won't leave them out, sort of thing. You know, if I had time, I, I, I would always do two meter FM. Yeah. So, how many people would you say you get on each activation you do with the, the two meter then? In the early days, my first activation um, was with Kevin M0XLT, who was chairman of the Otley Amateur Radio Society, where I was a member. I joined that in, t in January 2005. I didn't do my foundation until June because there were intermediate course running there. And I remember after the club night finished about 10 p.m. And I was I was talking to Kevin outside and he says, have you heard of this summits on the air? I says, I think I've worked a couple of those. Uh, and he gave me the website details uh, and I went and had a look and I logged my first contacts. And, and that is how I got into it through through Kevin. That was 2005. I think sort of started 2002. Yeah. So uh, Kevin's in the chat. He says, thanks. He's it's Kevin right. in the chat. Good evening, right Kevin there. M0XLT. Known him a lot of years. Great chap. Yeah, he says thanks for the mention. Uh, so let me go back here to this question for you, Chris. Uh, this is from Jose, one of our great uh, friends of the channel. And uh, personally, I, I know him. He's great. Uh, does, do, do you have a time limit uh, for yourself when you're on the summit? I don't have a time limit. It would depend on the weather. If the weather's not great, then I, I would uh, clear off quite quickly. Um I plan for summits, I keep an eye on. We have a five-day forecast over here in the UK, and I start watching. If I plan to do an activation on the Saturday, I'll start watching it five days before. And it can change. The weather can say it's going to be nasty, and then it can brighten up, or it can be bright on Saturday, and then it can go horribly wrong. So much depends on the weather. Um, but I do like to spend a little bit of time on the summits now, in, enjoying the views and things. I don't have time constraints. Um you need, as regarding summits on the air, you need to, as you know, you need four simplex QSOs to qualify the summit. I know people will get the four and then say thank you very much and leave the summit and sort of leave people people hanging. I, I don't really like that. Um, so, no, yeah, I'll always either. work the pile up. I'll always work who's there. But no no time constraints. I just, just enjoy myself. Yeah, good. We'll give uh, Brian and Dan a, time, a chance to ask a few questions here. But here's one uh, from me. Uh, so diver film shortwave he says he has a book number and to us uh us uh, westerners uh or uh, us guys anyway i have no idea what that means so can you explain that yes the book number we have an award scheme over in the uk called work tall britain uh, which was devised in 1969 by john golf 3 alpha, alpha bravo golf g3 abg to promote amateur radio interest in the uk Regarding Work Tall Britain, uh, the whole of the UK is divided into um, 100 kilometer, kilometer squares. Each of those 100 kilometer squares is uh, given two letters. Okay, then each of the 100 kilometer squares is divided into 10 kilometer squares and given two numbers, which will give you what's called uh, your Work Tall Britain reference. Mine is Sierra Echo 23. In Leeds, I think we're in the fourth biggest city in the UK, so there's plenty of radio amateurs, there's plenty of activity, so it's nothing rare. But when you go and activate portable, for instance, if I were to go on a summit, just not 
just close to where Kevin lives, MJ or XLT, there's a summit golf stroke November Papa 029 Sharp or the worked all Britain reference for that is Sierra Delta 95. So people collect they collect these references. There's loads of awards within Work Tall Britain. Regarding the book number, uh, you can join Work Tall Britain cheap. It's only about three pounds or so. And you, you're allocated, you, you get a book. This is mine, the Work Tall Britain Awards Group. There's uh, loads of information in there. But on the book, I have a number. I hope you can see that. Yep. Yep, see it. 19431. That's my book number. People will collect book numbers. There's awards for collecting book numbers as well. So sometimes if I'm out portable, I'll be asked, I'll be asked for the work to all Britain Square and I'll be asked for book numbers as well. So okay. that, that's cool. what the book numbers is. So is there is there um like certificates or awards in that yes. program? So yes, like, it's, it's like if you work all portable from all from all the different numbers or if you um, get all the numbers, uh, other people's numbers and stuff? Yes, there's awards for collecting book numbers. Off the top of my head, I can't remember how many you need for the first one. It could be 100 book numbers. That's not set in stone. That's just off the top of my head. The same with the grid squares for collecting them. There's, there's awards, there's timed awards that run like Christmas time. Uh, there's ones that run from January through to, to December. Uh, but there's, there's loads of awards with, with Work Tall Britain. The, the interesting one, um, we have things called trig points which are the concrete trig pillars that you see on top of most of the soda summers here in the UK. Uh, stone pillars, you, you might have seen them in some of my videos. There's over 6,000 of those in the UK. And uh, you, you can get awards for collecting them as well. Again, uh, when you're out activating, for instance, Sharpo, which I mentioned, Golf Stroke November Papa uh, 029, has uh, the trig point on top, Trick point number 5916. Trick points, there you go. Those concrete pillars. There's awards for collecting them as well. These can, these things can be on SOTA summits, the HEMA summits. Uh, they're, they're everywhere. There's one on the park just opposite where I live, about half a mile literally from where I am. And uh, there's awards for collecting those as well. Okay. Sounds like you've got a lot of programs. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about HEMA and WODA and uh, what those are. So could you talk a little bit about those? Then we'll turn some time over to Dan and Brian and let them ask a few questions because I'm hogging all the time. <laughs> okay, guys. The, the HEMA is uh, the Humps Excluding Marilyn's Award. Now, Summits on the Air is run from the Marilyn's list over here in the UK where the summit has to have 150 metre prominence all around. It's got to stand out from the, the surrounding land by 150 metres. The HEMA, um, them summits have to have a prominence of 100 metres. Um, and they, there's, there's plenty of them. It's a fantastic award scheme. Uh, incidentally, I just want to mention the summits on the air in the, the UK, the lower summits, you get one point, slightly higher, two points, four points, six points. The HEMA summits, all summits score one point regardless of the eleva elevation, regardless oh. of the height. They're all one point. All the HEMAs are one point. They're all one point, yes. Some some people think as well, because they're lower, because they the, the don't have such a prominence that they're easier. Generally, yeah, I suppose the, the, they are quite easy, some of them, as in summits on the air. There's some easy summits on the air over in this country. But some of them are monsters. Some of them are huge. They're, they're quite a, a long walk in, so some of the HEMA summits. Yeah, I think we we experienced that here in Arizona, where, you know, some a two point summit in the desert sometimes could be a, a, a huge expedition and undertaking, whereas you could drive up to a ten point in, in a matter of minutes. So yeah, it really depends. Uh, quick word on the water, the Wayne Wright's on the air scheme, which is up in the Lake District in the northwest of England. Um, there are two hundred and fourteen Wayne Wright fells. What's and a Wayne, Wainwright Fell? The Wainwright Fells. You probably might not have heard of a chap called Alfred Wainwright, which a lot of years ago, he uh, he did these these books, which I've got right here. Pictorial guides of the Lakeland Fells. Some of these are Sota summits, some are Hema summits. The mm -hmm. detail in these books is absolutely remarkable. Western Fells, yeah, Northwestern, okay. The, he walked 214 fells and detailed them in his book. 
in his series of books. So is a fell um, kind of like a summit or or a yeah, it's another yeah, it's another word for for a summit. Okay, it is a fell, and uh, there's awards for collecting each. Now, interestingly, uh, as you know, Sota summits and uh, as I mentioned, Hema summits, you need four simplex QSOs. Uh, for a water summit, for a Wainwright summit, you only need one simplex QSO to to qualify it. Uh, people often do them with just a, just a handheld, just on two meters. They, they might do a, a walk, they might do a loop where you do five or six uh, of these water water summits. Uh, the Wainwrights on the air. You get a crossover as well. Uh, you might activate a Hema summit or a Sota summit, which is also a Wainwright summit. That you yeah. get like the crossover. A lot of people don't realize. A lot of people do, but the, there's some that don't realize that. How, what do you think is the most uh, different crossovers you can have at one time? Uh, you can do a, a Hema, Wainwright, Soda, and anything else? Um, I mentioned Sharpo there, November Papa 029. Um, so that's a Soda Summit. It's a one point Soda Summit. It also qualifies for the Work Tall Britain Trick Point Award, uh, Trick Point 5916. The Work Tall Britain reference, Sierra Delta 95, so if we work Tall Britain, it also qualifies for the Worldwide Flora and Fauna. It has uh, the reference Golf Foxtrot Foxtrot 0266, and that's the Nidderdale area of outstanding natural beauty. The Sharpaw lies in um, a, a national park, and a lot of people don't realise this, as I say, so there's about four, four, three or four award schemes there just for activating that. Oh, interesting. All right, uh, Dan, you have any uh, uh, questions at this point? Yeah, I was just curious. Um, I've been to England a couple, several times, but uh, we never did anything like this uh, when I was there. And I didn't even realize how much of the country has some fairly substantial national parks. So I was kind of curious what it's like for you to be able to access the national parks and, and summits that uh, lie within those um the access issues are not too bad here in the in the uk we have um, a right to roam in england uh that allows you to access open access or access land without having to use paths although there are um various things that are, are in private land for instance there's one in the lake district there's a sort of summit golf stroke lima delta uh zero I uh, can't remember the number off the top of my head. Anyway, it's uh, Swinside is a summit, and it's on private land. You have to have permission. There we go. Lake District 057 Swinside. It's on a private estate used for rearing pheasants. Mm. So you can't just go walking all over there. You must obtain permission from the estate manager. I've never tried to do that. I don't know how difficult it is. I don't know if it's okay. Uh, but as a rule, uh, the, there's plenty... 90-95 percent of the country that you can that you can uh, walk on and, and activate these things that's interesting so right to roam me meaning you if it's an open space even though you you it ha may have a private landowner you can you still have the right to go on that space you yes yeah you, yeah you're allowed to these we've got summits uh, in the uk where the, the path might go off to the east and then to the north you can shortcut you can go straight across fields and things like that you know obviously taking care uh, not to disturb cat on things like that and sheep and things, but yeah, we're, we've pretty much got a right to roam. Wow, in that's, the UK. that's great. That's a good yeah, thing. I mean, that's different than here. Is that different to where you guys are? Yeah. Yeah. Go especially ahead, private land and things like that. You really, you have to ask, you know, get explicit permission to activate it. So sometimes it can be quite difficult even to just figure out who really even owns the land sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. I was going to say, I, I traveled to the UK. I, I'm Fortunately, I'm having trouble getting soda data to work right now, so I can't remember the exact names of the two summits I did, but I did one in Scotland and one just north of York. The one north of York was kind of in a farmer's field off the side of a road. I think it was called Bishop something or other Wald. Does that sound familiar? Bishop yeah, Weldon so Wald, I think is what it was called. The soda summit is uh, Tango Whiskey 004, Bishop okay. Wilton Wald. Yep, that's it. Um, you, you, you may have gone up a steep hill called Garraby Hill, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a drive on summit. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people look at these award schemes and think you have to be an athlete to activate some of these, but you don't. You don't have to be super fit. You know, there are some easy ones. Bishop Wilton Wald is a drive on, 
of course, for something that's on the air, you're not allowed to activate from the car. Yep. You have to be a reasonable distance from the car. So you can drive up there. You could walk, I don't know, 50 feet from your car, <coughs> use a handheld, and you can activate it. You don't have to be super fit. But I know Bishop Wilton Wald quite well. Yeah. yeah, I did that one on Simplex. There was When I was in the hotel in York the night before, I worked a, a bunch of local guys from one of the clubs there on the calling frequency. And they were out of in their get-together in the morning for breakfast, and they passed the HT around the table. And I uh, ended up working them all <laughs> on two meters um, <laughs> from the uh, from the summit. And then the one I did up in uh, in Scotland, which was near Inverness, uh, that one I did on HF. That was a lot of fun. I was working into uh, uh, all over uh, all over uh, the EU, actually. And I even had a, uh, a North American contact. I believe it was N four MJ. It would have been about three in the morning when I when I when I worked him. But that was that was a blast. All these uh, European calls coming back to me left and right on on CW. It was a good it was a good time. Yeah, it's it's nice of them that to help you out like that. <laughs> We had a holiday in Scotland 2012, uh, Natalie and I. I remember it because the Olympics were on over, over uh, the, the time. And I activated a local summit on 2 metre FM. I had a three element Yagi with me in the 817. Mm -hmm. And I started on 2 metre SSB and then I went to 2 metre FM. I worked one station, one contact. I could not raise anybody. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have the same difficulty. I had no HF gear oh, at yeah. the time. So that was oh, yeah. a failed activation, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know if you guys have had those. I've had one or, one or two of those in my time. But yeah, that was Scotland. Usually what happens with me is I pick the wrong way to go up the mountain, get about halfway up and realize this was a bad plan. And then by the time I get back down to go up the right way, it's a little <laughs> too late to try. So we just call it a day and go back <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, we've had those. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had failed batteries on the summit. <laughs> I got some batteries that go in the bottom of the 817 uh, and a charger uh, and I got some of those uh, and I activated some in the UK in winter time and the batteries really didn't like the cold. Uh, they just oh, went yeah. off. That was a failed activation. <laughs> yeah, I've been yeah. on the, the summit of Bugden Pike with Neil, M3 UNG, bless him. Uh, 66 mile an hour winds on the top. Ooh, wow. The high we climbed, he says, we really need to turn back, mate. I says, top's there. Let's just go to the top and that, that were a no-go as well. That were a It took me off my feet, blew me over. Oh, that, my gosh. That's that was cool. a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. Let's see. Real quick, let's go back to this one. The only two summits near me have uh, one co uh, cooperative owner and one very uncooperative owner, I understand. And, so, and uh, so back to the land issue here real quick. Let me just mention some, uh, that uh, in the United States, <clears throat> for soda, you have to get permission if the land is not public land. And that means... Uh, here in Arizona, especially, we have about 25% of the of the area, uh, land area in Arizona, is uh, owned by uh, tri uh, by uh, Native American tribes, and you cannot go on them without permission. Uh, wow. and, and then, in addition to that, and so there's there's probably you know several hundred peaks that are just off limits for that reason. And then, in addition, any time any type of private land uh, is is private land, and therefore you cannot access it without permission. So. Uh, but luckily, I would say, I don't know, probably 90, 95% of the peaks are on public land or on some sort of land that uh, we can gain access to easily. Even Thanks. even with the uh, Native American lands, if you can gain permission, uh, a lot of times um, you have to have a guide that is uh, living on, the, on that particular uh, reservation in order to access anything. Yeah. Right. I have, an, I have an interesting one. Okay. We have one in the Northern Pennines, not far from where I live, that you need access because I think it's on some sort of mili military land. Uh, there's some sort of shooting range. There's something going on up there. So you get in touch with these guys. I think they're quite reasonable at giving you permission, but they give you a time slot saying, you know, you're allowed to do the summit at, uh, say, 12 o'clock lunchtime. Uh, so that's when you do it, basically. You, you get on there and, and you get off. Uh, but the, the rest... Uh, the, the pretty, the pretty much you can. I won't say go where you want, but yeah, you, you're pretty free to, to run where you want. I'm just wondering if you guys um, have had any problems when you're on summits. I've not done a massive load of sort of activations. I think I'm on about a hundred. And a what couple kind of, of problems? Times, people coming up to you and, and they don't like they don't like what you're doing. You, you might have a mast up and a wire antenna. Uh, I was asked on one of my recent activations, Great Nautbury Hill. It was a weekday, uh, and I put up a, a, a pole 
uh, and a dive ball. And somebody asked me if it were permanent. They didn't like it being there. Uh, most people are okay, but you do get you do get one or two that can be a little little bit funny that don't like what you're doing, sort of thing. I always I, set up away from the trig point on the summit. I watch quite a few of your videos, Charlie, and uh, there's there's not many people about. We've got some really busy ones here in the UK. We have um, a walk that's quite famous worldwide called the Yorkshire Three Peaks, which is a 24 mile walk. It takes in Pennygent, Wernside and Ingleborough. All three of those are sort of summits. And in the summer, there's less people at the local shopping centre. Really, these are rammed with people. So regardless of the summit I'm doing, I always set up away from like the, the tree point anyway. The mountains are for everybody, aren't they? We don't want to go upsetting people. So I always set up away. People do come over and ask questions. So quite a lot are interested in what you're doing. But you, you just get one or two that can be a little bit awkward that don't like you doing what you're doing. Um, I don't know. I don't think you guys suffer too much over there, do you? I've, I've had some people, you know, on see me on top of a summit <laughs> primarily just ask, you know, what are you doing? And um, really, I didn't know that they still did ham radio. You know, I thought that was a dead thing a long time ago. Those kind of comments. But I've never had anybody have an issue with setting up and like, you said, and I think most soda operators are primarily that way. You try to, you know, if it's a well used summit, you know, you try to set up far away from where, you know, people typically like to roam and, and do their uh, viewing of, from the summit. Yeah, yeah, like I say, the mountains are for everybody out there. So they're there for us all to enjoy. So, you know, try not to go to go upsetting anybody. Yeah, I would think that like over here, we would primarily run into something like that on one of our summits that is local here to the Phoenix area. And I know Charlie and Brian have done a lot more of those local summits, you know, in town. So have you guys ever run into that? I know you guys have hit some of the ones that are very, you know, frequented by non-hams. You know, I've I've only time I've really run into uh, a lot of people are some of the Phoenix City summits. And I've not had any negative experiences. I've heard of other people. Sometimes you get uh, what we'll get here is the um, the, the local ranger. Um, and, and I'll use that term loosely. They, they give them a title, but, you know, they're they're, they're not uh, naturalists or anything. They're just, you know, the 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 right guy at the right time for the job, I guess. And they can be a little bit uh, overzealous with uh, what they think is right and wrong. But I, I have not run into that. I know we've had some some local activators that have told some stories about some of the, the Phoenix City Rangers being a little bit more uh, forward than they need to be about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Yeah, I, I would also say that uh, by far the majority of the summits that we activate here in Arizona have no trail to the top. And no trail means much less uh, traffic, right? So... Uh, yeah, those that have the trails to the top, they're they're busy, and and uh, I have on one or two occasions had somebody that asked questions, but not really anybody that had a problem with me being there. But uh, yeah, those the, some of them are really busy, and you, you, like you said, Chris, you got to set up well aware for, away from them to let them enjoy it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also it's, especially on those busy ones around in the city, it's a lot better if you just operate you know, with an HT and on two meter FM or something like that. So you don't have a big antenna structure up. Yeah. yeah. So I, I found the summit that I did in uh, Scotland. It was uh, Mount Eagle. Right. I don't know that one. Don't yeah. It's a, one. it's a one, it's a one pointer, um, kind of North, uh, West, Northeast of, uh, of Inverness. It's, uh, not terribly, it wasn't terribly difficult to access. You drove most of the way and then it was just a short walk up a road. Interestingly, did you use VHF on that one? No, that was the HF one. That was oh, the one the where HF. I was working all the all the, uh, all oh, the right. stuff, uh, all the uh, the Europe, the uh, EU countries. It was uh, it was pretty cool. No, that was in fact I didn't even try the HF because I was having so much fun on HF. Yeah, okay, guys, the, the HF in Scotland can be can be difficult. How come it just just uh, the distance or what? Um, <coughs> could be distance, could be surrounding hills, okay. uh, be be much higher than what you're activating. That happens in the Lake District quite a lot. If you're on a one or two point summit, you're quite often surrounded by ten point summits that, that are huge. But regarding the uh, being on a busy summit, I saw an interesting uh, conversation comment. Sorry, lately, if you use CW, you've got your headphones in and you're not uh, you're not speaking. So obviously you haven't got a microphone. 
so people you're gonna you're not gonna disturb them as much. And I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, Dom there, Hema summits tend to be quieter ones as everyone is climbing the bigger summits. Yeah, yeah. These these busy Hema summits up here. My, my favourite one, Skipton Moor, not far from where I live. There's a video on there. It's a fantastic little walk. Really interesting little summit. Uh, that's on, on one of my videos on YouTube. If, if you have a look at that, Natalie's with me on that one. Uh, quite a nice little loop that you walk. Good for VHF. Um, overlooks Skipton and the surrounding areas. That that's really good. Uh, but yeah, some are busy. So yeah. some are, some are quite. I, I do like the quieter ones. Yeah, me too. Uh, any other questions, Dan or Brian? Oh, go ahead. All right. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about um, your routine for preparing for portable uh, a, a portable excursion. Of, of course, we we covered the fact that you don't really have to get land permission too often. Uh, what other things do you do to plan for your excursions? Uh, of course, keep an eye on the weather. That's that's big. Uh, I've not had a soaking yet on a sort of summit. I've I've not got wet yet. Uh, so keep an eye on the weather. Um, <laughs> I've done things before where I forgot to put the batteries on charge. <laughs> oh boy! You know you you, you get oh, up the next day and you, you know you've, you've got to charge your batteries and things. I've done things like that. So I allow myself plenty of time now. If I put a spot on Sota or Hema that I plan to activate, some I tend to leave myself a little bit of extra time. I'm not as quick as I once was. Yeah, uh, I yeah. see some of the reports on the Sota site, and you guys are probably the same. You've seen someone activate a Sota summit, and it's says it's only an hour's climb. And I, you know, you walk for an hour, and you don't, you're nowhere near it. Um, so I leave myself extra time. Um, How do you get change all the your gear? Yeah, I always take food, take take uh, take drink with me, uh, and just leave some plenty of time. It's often said the activator is king. You're in charge. If you're early, you're early. If you're late, you're late. You're the you're the guys making the effort. The activators at the end of the day. Um, yeah. Whenever Brian and Charlie say, "Yeah, it's like an hour hike," I always leave myself another forty-five to, <laughs> minutes to an hour. <laughs> that sounds similar. That sounds similar <laughs> to me. Um, I met Natalie two thousand and eleven. Um, one of my favourite sort of summits is Northern Pennine 17, which is Fountains Fell, which overlooks the three peaks uh, the, uh, Yorkshire, Pennigan, Ingleborough, Wernside. Fountains Fell's at the side of there, but it's reasonably quiet. You barely see anybody up there. Uh, my best, I think I, I must have done it 15, 20 times, and it used to take me just over an hour just over an hour to walk, and I met Natalie, and I says, I do this radio thing, she says, oh, I like to go walking, so off we went, we did it in 45 minutes, <laughs> it was ridiculous, no stopping to take photos, no stopping for a drink tonight, no, come on, 45 minutes to the top, <laughs> I was almost dead when I got to the top. <laughs> I get up to the top and need to take a nap before you can operate. Absolutely, shattered. <laughs> okay, but see here. What I've always said is, it doesn't matter how long it takes you, to, to, to get to the top, um, you still get the same enjoyment, whether it takes you 45 minutes or, or it takes you an hour and a half, you still get the same enjoyment in the mountains. You know, it's still great fun. And I, and I think it makes a difference too where you are in the program if you're if you're still trying to get, you know, your GOAT designation or if you're done with that. I know my attitude changed significantly now. It's like, hey, if I drive, you know, two hours to get to a summit, um, I'm happy with just doing one. I don't feel the the need to hit three in one day anymore. Yeah, some do. Some people do too. Yep. Too uh, throw more don't they? Uh, and, and I take me hat off to them myself. But if that's what I can do, that's fantastic. Um, I noticed Kevin mentioned the first aid kit there. Yeah, that's always worth taking something. Yeah, uh, yeah. The first aid the basic kit. Basic first sure. aid kit, just in case. Regarding falling over accidents on on summits, once I've fallen in a, a bog. Almost up to my waist on the on Buckden Pike. It was really wet and horrible, Ooh. and it wasn't last year. It was the year before. Natalie and I were we were down in uh, North Wales on holiday, and we activated um, North Wales Forty, which is Taliban. Fantastic summit. It's a summit that we'd done before. That's not too difficult. Um, you just walk through through a few fields. There's a few little styles in the wall to get over. Um, and we were walking about halfway up, uh, and Natalie went over on her ankle. Um, 
badly sprained ankle, nine weeks off work. It's oh, wow. that easy. It's that easy. We came home. That were that were the Tuesday, or it could have been the Monday or the Tuesday. We were supposed to stay until Saturday, so we came home early at the hospital, and it were a badly sprained ankle, resulting in nine weeks off work. It's that easy. You yeah. Have to respect the hills, as you guys know. Yes, for sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, anything else from the chat room? Uh, throw that in. We're uh, we've got about uh, a, little, a little under fifteen minutes left in the in the interview. If we, unless we go over. Uh, so, Chris, is there, uh, let's talk a little bit about your channel. Uh, tell us about that and, and the viewers and kind of what they can find there and uh, your, you know, maybe kind of what you're trying to accomplish on, on that. Um, my channel, mainly portable videos, uh, videos for summits on the air, uh, the HEMA, there's some activations on there. Uh, I want to do more stuff regarding the parks on the air and the worldwide flora and fauna on HF. So I want to do two more of those just... There's, it's mainly portable operating, but there's, there's one or two videos regarding how to do certain things with an 817, things with the ICOM 705. But it, it's mainly portable operation on, on my YouTube channel. Yeah, I do see you do a lot of uh, uh, VHF, and there were some, some interesting, some kind of unique things that you've done in the past, too, up on some of the summits. Dan was mentioning one, I think, the other day to me. I couldn't, can't remember what it was, though. Well, I, I found that your soda presentation video was really, really good, but... The one that I really was interested in was the the Miracle Whip antenna you did oh, for right. the FT817. I thought that was an excellent video. And I've never seen, I've seen that antenna, but I've never seen anybody operate with it. And I'm pretty surprised at how well that antenna does. Yeah, the sort of presentation video. Um, in the past, I've done that presentation at local radio clubs. I've gone along, I've taken a laptop and I've taken some of my equipment um, and stood at the front and I've, I've done my bit and it, it goes down really really well I find over here in the UK there's quite a lot of people new to the hobby that come into the hobby that want to that want to do uh, the portable stuff they want to do something's on the air so I did that little presentation as we were locked down we weren't allowed to go out I thought I'll just put something together online just a basic little bit of information regarding something's on the air and, and it seems to have gone down well it's worth a look at. Yeah, I would encourage anybody that um, is looking for more information, just take a look at that video. It was, it's very well done. Thank you. Um, yeah, what's the name of your channel, by the way? Uh, my call sign should find it, Chris yep. M0RSF. Cool. So if anybody wants to go and have a look, <laughs> yeah, which cool. nobody does. <laughs> yeah, you get with some people. Hopefully some more people come and look at it. Uh, yeah. Host Jose says, uh, what's Chris's favorite time of year to do activations? Is is he a winter or summer guy? A little bit of both, to be fair. Um, you guys are probably the same. It's really difficult climbing a mountain when it's uh, when it's hot. You, the sweat's in your eyes and you're all hot and it's stingy and horrible. Um, I have done winter activations, um, which interestingly, I was talking to one of the chaps at the radio club that I used to be a member of. Um, and he, he lives local to me and he's about 500 feet above sea level uh, and I was up at one of the northern Pennines which is two and a half thousand feet and he could not believe that I was sat in snow it, it snowed up there there were four feet of snow and he couldn't believe it I says I'm not wow. staying I'm going to work I'm going to work what's he I'm going to work the pile up and I'm off and he, he, he didn't <laughs> believe it till I showed him photographs at the radio club I says this yeah. is what it was like for me it, yeah. you know yourselves Elevation, it can be be very, very different. Um, yeah. So no, I don't, I don't like it red hot, but I don't, I don't like it too cold as well. Yep, yep. Uh, that's creatures' uh, comforts, right? Uh, not too hot, not too cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just comfortable. Yeah. All right, Chris. Uh, let's let's open it up to you. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to talk about at all? Um, the, the the people I find the people in the UK, as I say, as you notice on the channel, it's mostly the HF stuff. I find that people are the really the clued up. They know about summits on the air. They know what you're doing, and they understand that you give a signal report, the reference. Thank you very much. But there, were, there was one chap that I, I felt a little bit sorry for. It was winter time, and I was out activating something, and I put out a CQ call on two meter FM, and it came back to me, and we QSY to a frequency. And I told him where I was, I gave him a signal report, and I said, right, okay, I'll, I'll move on. And he said, his exact words were, 
what's wrong? Don't you want to talk to me? <laughs> he wanted to tell me about what? his caravan and things. <laughs> and I explained, I says, you know, it's, it's like minus two up here. I'm really cold. It's not that I don't want to have a queue so here. I just want to get what I need and, and clear off. But most people are, uh, are they, they are clued up. It's probably the same way where you guys are. Um, oh, yeah, regarding the Miracle Whip, fabulous little antenna is that if you don't expect too much of it. It's only a 57-inch whip with a little uh, tuning capacitor on the on the bottom. It's never going to be a five-element Yagi 30 feet in the air. But I have had some success with that antenna. I used to have a static van, a static caravan on the East Coast um, by the seaside that we used to go to. And I used to take it there. It's quick to set up. It'll get you contacts. I used to do a little bit on HF. It was fantastic on two metres with the local repeaters that were, that were around there. Um, and it were okay. In fact, I used to drive over Bishop Wilton Wall to get there, to get to the East Coast. And I used to stop off and do that something quite often. But yeah, the Miracle Whip's, whip's quite a good antenna. What I do want to finish up on, um, and I'm sure, and I just know you guys will agree on this, is there might be people watching this. There might be people who obviously watch your channels that might be thinking of going out portable. What I'd like to say is, this is massive safety. Don't take unnecessary risks, okay? It, I'm looking outside now, it's dark. Here in the UK, about four o'clock at the moment, it's, it's dark. So don't get some massive idea that uh, about one o'clock in the afternoon that you're going you're gonna to get into this portable thing and you're going to activate that summit down the road that's 3,000 feet because you'll be, send, be descending in the dark, right? Don't do it. What I would say is start off small, Find a, a HEMA summit, find a SOTA summit local to you, something small. Take someone with you, a friend, a family member if you can. If you are going by yourself, <laughs> tell someone where you're going. Don't take risks. That's uh, that's that safety is a massive part of it all for me. And I'm sure it's the same for you guys. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, Have I a plan. Go ahead, Brian. I was going to say, absolutely, have a plan. Let people know where you're going and who to call if you don't come home. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, my son and I, we, we set off at one winter time to do a, a 10 point summit in the Lake District. And on the drive up, there'd been an accident, a road traffic accident. And we were delayed by an hour and a half. It was a summit that I'd not done before. So finding the, um, the parking spot was interesting. So I'd never done it before. And obviously we're delayed. We probably got two thirds of the ascent, two thirds of the way up the summit. I could see the top and it was now like two o'clock in the afternoon. And I said to my lad, I says, no, we're abandoning this. We're going home. And he were really disappointed. He really wanted to get to the top. It were icy, it were cold. There were a little bit of snow on the ground. And I says, no, the mountains will be there another day. We really need to get off here because otherwise we're going to be descending in the dark. It's, it's not ideal. The mountains are there another day. That's why I say safety first. It's massive. Yeah, the hills are great fun, but the, the, you know they can bite on the backside if, if you don't know what you're doing. So start off small, be careful, and Very enjoy wise. yourselves. Yes, w words of wisdom there. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Va Va Three's OSO says great advice to start close to home. First few times out, you will forget something. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm sure we've all done that. We forgot things. We forgot a cable or a CW paddle or something. We, we've all done it. I always take a handheld with me, always. Um, a little two-meter FM handheld for that reason, if you've got something, you know. Yeah. If, if you've had a couple of hours drive somewhere, then another couple of hours ascending a mountain, um, you know, and you forget, you forget you found a cable, you forgot a cable or you forgot something or other, that handheld might just bail you out. It might just get you the contacts that you need to, to qualify the summit and save you having a wasted journey. For sure. All right. Uh, anything, any closing comments from you, Dan? Um, no, I was just very surprised in, uh, at how different it is uh, in the UK and probably all over Europe. So if I ever get back that way, I know I, I uh, want to take a trip to back to Belgium where my parents are from and uh, there's some soda summits over there. So I've been kind of looking at those. So I'm hoping to do uh, at least do one or two in Europe at some point. So it should be fun. Yeah. It's fascinating as well. I noticed watching the, watching the videos that you guys produce, how things are different, how the landscape sometimes different. 
the, the plants, the, the, the wildlife and things like that, how different they are in, in the UK. It's, it's fascinating. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Brian, go ahead. I, I was gonna say I, I uh, you know I enjoyed my my time over in the uh, in the UK and and those you know those two activations that I did it was it was interesting connecting with the local people on two meters they were really uh, very excited to talk to to talk to a, a someone from the United States on two meter FM they got a big kick out of it the guys up in New York spent uh, I think close to two hours sitting on the balcony at the hotel um, chatting with the with those gentlemen and then the next day uh, they were disappointed that I didn't come to breakfast but they were excited to work the soda summit so I guess it worked out <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right Chris well I really appreciate you coming on I know uh, uh, it's it's in the afternoon there uh, but uh, best of luck to you with your uh, whatever you collect, whether it be summits or or uh, heaps or or weighing points or whatever it is, whatever you got, you call them all over there, uh, and uh, best of uh, uh, health and everything to you and your family, uh, and I hope that uh, you know people join uh, go uh, subscribe to your channel uh, if you if you're listening, give it a try. I think it's a really interesting stuff that he does out there, and and uh, so go subscribe to his channel. Is you can just search for uh, Mike Zero or Romeo Sierra Foxtrot, and uh, it should uh, come right up on YouTube. Um, so with that, I think we'll close it out. Um, anything else, guys? Thanks for having me, guys. It's been brilliant talking to you guys. I will keep an eye on the sort of um, the sort of spots, the reflector. I know if you guys are going out in October. Uh, I'll keep an eye out. I really want to have a summit, to, summit to summit contact with you guys on SSB yeah. or CW sometime. That'd be fabulous. It's been really nice talking to you. It's food time for me now. Um, so stay safe, enjoy the hills. And uh, once again, thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, thanks for being on. Yeah, uh, thanks stay, for coming stick, on. Thank you. Stick around after we end the stream. Uh, Chris, we'll talk, chat for just a minute afterwards. All right, guys, uh, talk to everybody on the, the next stream coming up, which is in about a... I don't know, about two weeks, I suppose, a little less than that. So 73, everybody. Thanks, guys. 73.